Bon. Steve, can you hear? Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Paka. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Right. Just wanted to check on the audio. Yeah, yeah, I am fine. To hear clearly or not. Hi, Vasuki. Hi, Shekhar. Hi, Vijay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. I'm I'm also online. Hi, I'm Vijay. Hi, Vijay. Hi. Hi, Chandru. Steve. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good, Good evening, evening, sir. All, sir. So, I'll I'll go on mute, okay, so that uh, whoever is speaking can speak, and you'll not find any yeah. home noises unnecessarily interrupting. Hello, Vasuki. Hello there, I was muted. Yeah. Uh, Vasuki, Ranga Reddy here. Hi, Ranga Reddy. How are you? It's been long, long I'm time. I'm fine. Nice to, nice to hear you and nice to see you. We are all gone, uh, you know, gone bald and grown over old yet. I, I don't believe that in your case, Ranga Reddy. <laughs> 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 in a long time I think 2006 was the last time we met we met yes are you still with the Hindu no I retired about 6 years back okay yeah I'm totally free now oh. yeah Bensi is also waiting for the thing to start. Oh, okay. That's good. Ben C. Vijay Dev. Ben C. Vijay Dev. Yes, Vijay Dev. Oh, yeah. Veera. Oh. Yeah, I sent the links to them also. Okay. I hope they will join. You think your face cut has changed, Vasuki? You're not looking like what you were 40 years back. So, so who is looking, looking the I'm same? I'm looking significantly older, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> hi, Chandru. How are you doing? Hi, 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 Ranga. I'm doing well. Where are you now? Washington? No, no, no. I'm in Dubai. You're in Dubai? Yeah, a, okay. I've got a client assignment. So it really works out well. Because okay. In DC, the time would have been... Uh, uh, staying I mean, it would have been very early there? in the morning. It would have been very early in the morning. You're staying there or traveling there? Traveling, traveling. I'll traveling. be here for a few weeks. Oh, good evening. Hey, Som, how hey, are you? Good evening, how are you? I think I just got some background which I'm not able to get it out. 
Don't are you promoting it? No, 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 I think. Uh, yeah, the yeah, right I target audience for that. Hmm? Yeah, the right target I audience for that. Right. Uh, what's, the, what's the time there now? Is... I'm in Dubai, so, hmm. so it's only 4, 4.55 in the evening. One oh. and a half hours behind. Good. So... Uh, now I can see you, Ranga. Yeah. Things are normal in Hyderabad with uh, COVID? Yeah, looking like near normal. Okay. Not many cases though. So we are trying to be normal. I don't know. <laughs> I think the chief minister has... Uh... Uh, assume that uh, we should go ahead uh, life uh, as normal, celebrate, restrain and uh, enjoy. I think he is giving equal, equal opportunity to all businesses and people. He <laughs> <laughs> had a very aspirational career, Vasuki, I must say, because I think I lost touch for 20 years and then after that when I found out, uh, I think through Zoom or someone, suddenly I discovered that uh, you become a completely new persona. New Business person? In, Hopefully new persona. not. <laughs> persona. So suddenly I saw you get into international relations and right. I think the first time I got exposed to you once was that book on Indonesia you wrote. Uh, that was the time I said, yeah, your name familiar. Ed. I heard this name Vasuki somewhere. And then I did the Google search and then found that, okay, the same Vasuki. But it travels the world. That well in life. Vasuki has that's become Vasuki. Vasuki Shastri. That's why. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, no, there well, are other Vasuki, Vasuki Belawadi or somebody is there. <laughs> because it used to be SN Vasuki. Which was SN Vasuki, Vasuki, I remember your initials. When I joined the, the IMF they, uh, in the US, you have to have a first name and a last name. Uh, initials yeah. don't work. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you are still with IMF? No, no, I'm, I'm out of the IMF. I'm, I'm doing my own thing now, uh, okay. Chandu. I'm an Asia Fellow at Chatham House. I write and then I do some consulting. So. Well, a friend of mine was heading travel at IMF, Mustafa Kamal. Okay. Um. So you're busy 365 days or you're relaxing somewhere? You must be around my age, 60 plus, right? I'm, yeah, absolutely. I'm 63. So, uh, no, I keep busy. I think I'm kind of addicted to work. So, can't, as long as I'm able to, just want to continue doing this. Good. Been to the expo? Yes, I've been to the expo, yeah. I think uh, six thirty-five or so. We should start with or six forty. That's minute for our. Uh, actually, uh, some people are connecting on the YouTube also. Yeah. Okay. So I think we should uh, maybe start in another five minutes or so. What do you think? Yeah. An idea. When did things start on time? Hmm. Yeah, well, because we, even when you have it in staff college, you have to wait 15 minutes for people to, even if you tell them 6.15, they'll come at 6.45. That's the problem. Hyderabad chai pee ke nikal nahi mein time lagta na? Hyderabad ka reputation laga na na, I see. If you're free, you can catch up with one of our journalism colleagues there. Uh, department colleague uh, who's heading the biggest PR agency in Dubai, Sunil John. So oh, I know Sunil very well. I've, you know Sunil very uh, well. Very, uh, very good friends, yeah. Okay, okay. I meet him very regularly here. Okay. Sunil and I were in college together, SP College. Oh, SP College, okay. I was there last year with him. 
I think I, I can see Sayyid Akbaruddin also. Yes. Very nice of him to have joined. Yeah. He, yeah, said, he joined just now. He said, I'll try to join and he has joined, which is nice. Thank you. So we'll start in about five minutes. Yeah. Yes. I, I just want to put... 6.40. Yeah, if you give yeah. me... Yeah, I could give Will me two not, minutes. Uh, I want to put my phone on. I want to put the ringer on mute. If you just give me two minutes, I'll just go off video. I'll okay. be back in two minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Mohan Raj is trying to connect on YouTube. He wanted... Oh, I'll just speak to him. Hello? Yeah. Pratakar is not joining. Acha, Pratakar, not part of the report. No. Chandru, what's happening? Life goes on. I'm uh -huh. seeing Akbar, of, Akbar live after 30, 35 years. He was the president of my JC's club and I was the secretary long, long back. I think 30, 35 years back or 40 years back. I don't even remember that. I'm seeing him live after so many years. Other than the fact that I saw him on television. Good to see you, Akbar. Hi. Hi, Chandru. It's Hi, not live. It's still virtual. Yeah. <laughs> it's still virtual. <laughs> Good to see you in Hyderabad, back in Hyderabad. So maybe if you start off, people will join whenever they want. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> 640, 640. Yeah. yeah. 38 now. Hmm. Mohan Raj is trying to connect on uh, YouTube. So he had a problem with the link, so I'll just send him again. Vijay. Yeah. You face the light. I should face the light. So yeah. will it help my looks? Yeah, it will help because now you are looking very dark. I am dark, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you are not dark. Uh, I'm of Dravidian <laughs> stock, as they call nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me move to where the yeah, light you is. move the chair. That is good enough. Okay. Hello, Mr. Akbaruddin. I am Ranga Reddy. Now, do I look fair? Hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh nice. that's quite a dramatic change. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, God. Are you going Krishna Rao, is there the same Krishna Rao as your batchmate? Ah, Krishna Rao, yeah. Hi, Krishna. Krishna Rao. <clears throat> I think Vasuki is waiting for a queue to start. Yeah. Who's going to go into the queue? Raga? Vijay? Huh? I think let's uh, <clears throat> ready for a queue to start. Six forty in my 
uh, mobile. Huh? And yeah. 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 I think uh, uh, very good. A very good evening, friends. <clears throat> On behalf of the Professor Bashiruddin Memorial Trust, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you this evening. And especially so to Vasuki Shastri, who agreed to deliver the lecture this year. This is the 17th in the series of annual lectures being organized in Hyderabad to commemorate and celebrate the contributions of Professor S. Bashiruddin, a renowned personality in India's media education world. Over the years, some of the well-known personalities who delivered the lecture include S. Jaipal Reddy, M. J. Akbar, Paranjay Guha Takursa, Dr. Sanjay Baru, Dr. Mohan Raj, Mr. Mohan Guruswami, Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan, Krishna Prasad, the Outlook Editor, and Syed Akbaruddin, uh, who is present this evening. Very, very warm welcome to you also. During uh, COVID-19, in the last one, two years, we had a lot of difficulty in organizing this lecture, which was quite popular, held in the physical world, in the nice uh, uh, environment of Administrative Staff College of India. But somehow we managed to get on to the virtual world and uh, organized the lecture in December 2020. And thanks to Professor Madhabushi Sridhar, uh, who was uh, uh, then with the Bennett uh, Coleman University uh, in Delhi, he delivered the 16th lecture. Uh, he was also the former uh, Central Information Commissioner, and at present he is at Mahindra University. It was a purely uh, new type of a experience for the trust. We had taken the uh, help of the Usmania University and uh, done that uh, experiment. And today we are glad that uh, we, though we have not come out of the virtual world, the Bashiruddin Memorial Lecture is continuing and we have a very distinguished speaker this time too. Uh, for the benefit of uh, some of the journalism students and the newer generation of journalists, I would uh, briefly introduce Professor Bashuridan to them. For most journalists, media relations and professionals in journalism, Professor Bashuddin hardly needs any introduction. He is one of the unique uh, personalities who was a student, a teacher, and head of department of the Usmania University Journalism. For at least two decades, from 1970 to 90, he was synonymous with the Usmania University Journalism Department and Hyderabad Media. He was the founder of the Public Relations Society of uh, the Hyderabad chapter. Professor Bashiruddin was a prominent personality in journalism education, both in stature, physically, and in contributions. No wonder he was one of the pioneers in education, in uh, journalism, PR, and also made uh, remarkable contributions in uh, teaching or advertising. He was an ambassador of his alumni and the students of Usmania University. And at every opportunity, he explained or he told about the achievements of his students. No wonder he was also made the ambassador of India to Qatar by the PV Narsimara government during the early 90s. He returned to become the vice chancellor of the B.R. Ambedkar Open University, and post uh, his retirement, uh, he continued to motivate students. And a testimony to this is a large number of alumni who are doing very well in the world of media. And today, I have the great privilege to present to you one of them in Vasuki Shastri. So, uh, about Vasuki, uh, briefly, I would like to uh, go on a personal note and uh, tell you that uh, the first time I met Vasuki was not as a journalist, but as a 
quiz master. It was sometime during the early 1980s, I was also a uh, participant in quiz. So one of the intercollegiate quizzes he conducted. And uh, after that, uh, I joined the K Circle Club in second band YMCA. And I found Mr. Vasuki uh, very interestingly uh, having a routine of going to Sangeet theater, watching a movie, attending a circle club, and uh, perhaps I think the next day writing a review in one of the newspapers. He was not only a popular quiz master, a journalist, but also very good in Hollywood movies and uh, you know uh, music. That was how I met uh, uh, Vasuki for the first time. Thereafter, as a journalist, Vasuki started with a small newspaper in uh, weekly, I think in Hyderabad, started by Yashasvi. Thereafter, he moved to Business India, where he covered extensively the economic and uh, financial aspects and the corporate developments during the late 80s. From there, he moved to Singapore and joined the Singapore Straits and covered extensively the uh, growth and emergence of the Asian Tigers during the 1990s. He also covered the revolution in Indonesia during the 1996-97 phase. And as most of you would know that uh, the economic reforms in India during the PV Narasimharao uh, regime and also the emergence of Asian uh, economies and thereafter the decline was one of the great phases which helped uh, Vasaki to make a mark in business and financial journalism. His rich and diverse experience took him to the International Monetary Fund where he spent a good part of uh, nearly a decade in both the headquarters in Washington and also in Indonesia, where he got a lot of uh, interesting insights, which culminated into a book on a resurgent Indonesia, which uh, made a good mark. In the uh, private sector, which uh, Vasuki decided to move, uh, he joined the Standard Chartered Bank, where he was head of uh, public policy and sustainability for a few years. In the post-2010 phase, he moved into public policy, strategic communication, and his uh, diverse interest, uh, he put it into two books. One is The Resurgent Indonesia from Crisis to Confidence. The second is a more recent publication called uh, Asia has it lost it, a dynamic past and a turbulent future. Now, this book written in the background of the impact of the pandemic has been selected a finalist at the American Book Fest Best Book Awards for 2021. We are really very happy that it has made it to this list, Vasuki. In 2019, Vasuki was appointed by the British Queen to serve as a commissioner of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Now, I was a bit surprised. Uh, and that was the time when I reconnected with Vasuki. Then I asked him, what is his new role about uh, this Commonwealth War Grave Commission? And Vasuki told me, uh, I think that will bring me to Hyderabad after a long time, because one of the tasks was to uh, identify and document the uh, graves of British officers in India and elsewhere. And uh, there were quite a few in Secunderabad and Hyderabad, so that would definitely bring him to this city. But unfortunately, the pandemic has not uh, given this opportunity. I hope we will see him soon in Hyderabad. He is also an Asia Fellow for the think tank Chatham House and an advisor for the global firms on ESG, environmental, social and governance, which are very important in the corporate governance and strat strategy communications. With this uh, introduction, I have great pleasure in presenting to you Mr. Vasuki Shastri, 
my illustrious senior and our department alumni to go ahead and deliver the 17th Professor Bashiruddin Memorial Lecture. Over yeah. to Vasuki. Yeah, before, before uh, Vasuki starts, just one, uh, this one. Uh, Mr. Ramkrishna, who's uh, handling the uh, uh, you know, link, etc. I believe the YouTube is not opening yet. There are some people waiting. If Ramkrishna Garu can, you know, ensure or Steve can talk to somebody. Uh, and and I'll, I'll just speak to him, just a moment. Yeah, please. Okay. okay. I'll just. Because Pradeep Krishnatri and a few others have called. Yeah, well, one second. One second. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Vasuki, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for the generous introduction, Soam. I mean, uh, uh, I, I had to cringe with all your generous praise uh, about me and my career. Uh, obviously, what I want to do uh, this evening is, is to talk a little bit of, about my reflections. Don't want to be pompous to talk about all of the career highlights uh, that I've gone through in the past few decades. So my first thing is really to, you know, to say to the ladies and gentlemen of Hyderabad's journalism and the wider public policy community, how delighted I am today to speak to all of you. Uh, I'm a true blue Hyderabadi, uh, unfortunately, have not lived in Hyderabad since 1985. Uh, and I think my last trip was in 2006, where I had an opportunity to connect uh, uh, with a few colleagues, I actually went down to the Usmania Department of Journalism. And unfortunately, it was vacation time, so I could not see anybody. So, you know, even though, uh, unfortunately, I'm not there in uh, person, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for me personally to reconnect with Hyderabad to reconnect with uh, OU journalism, uh, alumni and, and colleagues. And really this is an opportunity also for me to say thank you because uh, you know, I reflect on my career and I think the foundations for that uh, were clearly built in uh, the one year that I spent doing BCJ. Uh, and, and, and for that really, I must uh, thank Professor Bashiruddin and his esteemed colleagues. Uh, and, you know, one striking thing about Professor Bashiruddin and, you know, during the course of my career, of course, I've met with lots of academics, is how unacademic he was in his approach uh, uh, to education, to really impart uh, all the skills and knowledge about communication, right? So, you know, your typical stereotype of a college professor, and my apologies to those college professors on this call, I don't mean any disrespect, really is to be kind of boring, to be kind of strict. And Professor Bashiruddin was, you know, he was erudite. Uh, he was incredibly funny. He had a wicked sense of humor. And the education he imparted was both the theoretical, you know, the theoretical aspects of communication and journalism, as well as the more mundane practical aspects. And one thing that I always remember, and I don't know if colleagues who studied under the professor will remember, he would give us practical advice that if you're in a journalism or PR career, you had to spend long hours during the day when you did not have opportunity to, to have a lunch break. So he used to take out his bag and say that he always carried a bag of treptin biscuits. I don't know how many of you remember that, uh, uh, which he always used to carry and always used to advise us. Now I forgot all about treptin until I landed in Indonesia in 1995. Uh, actually, this anecdote dates back to 1998 when Indonesia was hit by a revolution. So all of us journalists had to be on the streets. We were covering student protests. We were following politicians as they were uh, uh, making statements against uh, President Suharto. Many stores were shut, restaurants were shut. And during the course of an eight hour day, I really became hungry. And an Australian journalist colleague opened his bag and he said he always carried Treptin biscuits with him. And I had that Treptin biscuit saying, here's a toast to good Professor Bashiruddin, <laughs> who, who planted that idea many decades ago. Now in a gathering of this kind, I think it's polite for us, or polite for me to say, uh, what a wonderful fair-minded Professor Bashiruddin was. Uh, but I actually have an interesting anecdote from that period to actually illustrate his fair-mindedness uh, and, and I'm sure that practice even exists today. In our time, we had to go through a journalism entrance exam. Uh, and, you know, that was a pretty competitive exam because uh, uh, 
the journalism department, to use the language of today, was considered to be the coolest uh, uh, department in OU Arts College. There was fierce competition to get in. And, you know, I, uh, uh, thanks, thanks to Soam's endorsement of my previous uh, uh, incarnation as a quiz master, I was feeling pretty confident about my ability to get into DJ because of all this knowledge of current affairs and uh, general knowledge. So I gave the exam, I thought I would appear in the past five, uh, in the top five. That could be complete uh, overconfidence on my part. And much to my horror, I went to the OU Arts College lobby to look at the list of people who had made it to the interview stage and my name was not there. Now, you know, I was completely devastated uh, because journalism was the only thing that I wanted to do. I suffered through three years of undergraduate. I shall not name the college. I did BCom. Uh, it was just a very, very mediocre experience for me. I was a mediocre student myself. Maybe that's the reason why it was a mediocre experience. But I was raised a sharp focus on becoming a journalist. And not being able to get through the entrance exam uh, was, was a terrible experience. Uh, but maybe it was my stubbornness. I decided to go down to the basement and encountered a lecturer who shall remain nameless. And I confronted him to say, you know, this, there's something really, really wrong with this because I, could, I should have gotten, I should have been in the top five. The professor very politely told me, you know, very competitive exam, you should try next year. But something in me made me to, uh, uh, and, and you know, incredible thing about Professor Bashirudin was this open door policy. I don't know how he did it. I mean, I tried open door policy in my career uh, at the IMF and, uh, and Standard Chartered Bank, and it's really a disturbance when you've got all kinds of people coming into your door. So I walked into his office and I was a complete nobody. I had no influence. And he was the esteemed professor of journalism, very well known. And I blurted out to him my grievance that I had not made it to the entrance through the entrance exam. And uh, uh, I rightly felt that I had passed the exam, but I had done very well. Now he could have shooed me away. He could have just said, you know, you're really an intrusion into my time and why should I listen to you? You're sweating profusely and, and you're very nervous uh, 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 when speaking. Uh, but I think something in him uh, 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 really sparked this. So he asked me to take a seat. He asked me to repeat uh, every, uh, my, my particular uh, complaint. I told him that, you know, journalism is all I ever wanted to do. And, you know, uh, uh, I was a quiz master at K-Circle. So how could I fail this exam? So he then proceeded to ask me a few questions from the entrance test. To cut a long story short, he said, just leave this with me. And then I had to leave. I mean, I didn't know what leave this with me meant. And a few days later, much to my shock, uh, I made it back into the top five of the entrance exam. Uh, and in many ways, it was thanks to Bashiruddin's fairness to give an opportunity to someone who, who really shouldn't have uh, uh, intruded into his privacy. But he gave me a second chance because he figured out that my mark sheet had been erroneously uh, 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 marked. And he asked that to be retabulated and my name was back. And he chuckled when we met during the panel interview uh, that I had been a casualty of, of uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, error. And, you know, I stand before you today in many ways, uh, thanks to Bashir, Professor Bashiruddin's kindness, because I don't know what I would have done if I had not been able to get through to BJ that particular year. And I also want to add, before I get to the substance of my, my presentation today, that the one year that I spent in 1978-79 was probably the most impactful education that I ever received. The fact that I have not studied ever since in a formal sense is really a reflection that I felt coming out of BJ in, in uh, 1979, that I was really prepared uh, for a career in the real world. And the skills and the tools uh, that were imparted to me by, uh, uh, by the department, you know, the, the most remarkable thing for me uh, about OU journalism is how it opened the 
windows to the world for someone like me right you suddenly were in this department where everyone was not only talking about national journalism issues they were talking about the world i mean the first time i ever saw a copy a print copy of the new york times or the washington post was at ou journalism department and every professor you spoke to at that time had a very clear sense that they were part of this global profession that yes we were based in hyderabad we had to focus on local issues uh, but there was a global ethos and you know that for me that was the most important seed that was planted uh, by uh, professor bashiruddin but let me also take the opportunity to name other professors uh, abdul rahim rahim plv nargis ibrahim usharani vyasulu pradeep krishnathre who apparently is on the call and sinwas rajgopal i mean they were communication masters and today from my perspective you know i stand on their shoulders and my career would not have been possible uh, without that one year in bcj and you know to soms point about my obsession with uh, hollywood which i still retain until today i mean no other department of usmania would have allowed me to have done my dissertation in bj on what i loftily call the new hollywood and poor nargis ibrahim had to had to really suffer through my presentation on on everything that was happening in hollywood and this is really the not only the gener- generosity of spirit i think uh, by the department but it's also this open mindedness of allowing students to think beyond the obvious which was for me the most critical take away Uh, uh from that time and and you know i retain many of those uh, important pieces of education that i received even today now you know i've i've been away from uh, uh bj for 42 years 42 long years and it probably shows in my girth and and in my weight and in the way i'm speaking today and you know uh, one one key lesson that i learned i think from professor bashiruddin was you know diversity of career and and you know never to be satisfied uh, uh to be in one place to be kind of restless i mean to be restless and reckless at the same time uh, not to have a plan b in your career to kind kind of you know get this diversity of experience uh, uh and so this my career has you know taken me from uh, hyderabad to bombay i still call it bombay uh, apologies to everyone on the call Uh, into singapore into indonesia into washington dc and london and one thing that has kept me going is really uh, what a fascinating world we live in and and how much more there is to learn uh, for me in journalism in the in in communication and you know uh, I, i know i'm speaking to the student body of uh, both bj and mj as well as today there's one piece of advice that i'd like to give uh, to this new generation of course you you are coming coming of age at a very very different time compared to mine uh, is really you know uh, to think of journalism as a free education uh, and i think uh, as i mentioned i suffered through 3 years of bcom learning very little about economics uh, finance and accounting but thanks to professor nj yashasvi who gave me my first job running india's first investment magazine where i was writer sub editor proof editor and print coordinator all rolled into one and then the professor in his spare time educated me about economics and finance you know learning on the job uh, uh, has a tremendous value to it and i think uh, it it was much more difficult i think in our time to learn on the job it's much easier now given the access to online tools to online education uh, that the new generation has so you know in many ways i do envy the position that you are in because the world is your oyster at this point in time and uh, uh, coming look, looking back 41 years so i made the journey from hyderabad with business india magazine and then moved to mumbai and uh, uh, the critical thing at that time was 
India was coming out, <clears throat> apologies. India was coming out of the emergency. There was an absolutely new brand of journalism that was being practiced. You, know, you had new magazines, Sunday, India Today, Business India. And everyone was trying to push the envelope because the experience that Indian journalism came out during the emergency was, I think, a very scarring one. And I think L.K. Adwani's uh, uh, famous comment uh, that journalists and journalism in India between 1975 and 77, they were asked to bend, but they crawled instead. I think for our generation, that was a very chastening experience because we recognized that uh, journalism failed. Uh, during the emergency. And our generation, in a way, had to take up the cudgels, had to reinvent, reinvigorate journalism, which is what essentially happened in uh, the 1980s. And I think Indian journalism's uh, brightest moment, when I look back, and, and not merely because uh, Som and me started the, our careers around the same time, uh, was literally, I think, the 1980s. That was the strongest foundation that the Indian journalists uh, and, and journalism uh, provided for successive uh, generations. Now, I want to talk a little bit about you know, the theme of my speech, which I'm happy to submit. Uh, uh, I mean, I've got a prepared speech, but I'm speaking ex tempore, but I'll send it to the trust uh, for the record. I thought I'd explore three themes. And, and really the context is, you know, the, the generation that I'm coming from, uh, globalization was the organizing principle. Everyone believed that, you know, if a country pursued policies for free trade investment, uh, that, that was the best possible way for a country to prosper. And I think in Asia for a long period of time, uh, that was the, not only the conventional wisdom, but there was overwhelming evidence uh, that the rise of the Japan and the Asian tigers, and indeed the rise of China, India, and Vietnam would not have been possible without this embrace of uh, globalization. I know globalization has got a bad word these days, and, uh, and, and in many cases justifiably so, uh, because the true fruits of globalization has not been equitably dis distributed uh, you know, between countries and within countries. But you know, that's not going to be the theme and topic of my speech. Uh, taken that I come out of the globalization era, where, you know, so when I moved to Indonesia in 1995, it was remarkable. Uh, uh, there was no expectation for me as a journalist to learn the local language. Uh, of course, I went through it because, you know, you can't cover the foreign land if you don't know the local language. You don't know the local language, you don't understand the context, you don't understand the nuance. And for a period of time, uh, when I was starting out as a correspondent in Indonesia, it didn't really matter uh, whether I knew the language or not, because all of my interlocutors, which was the business elite and the political elite, I mean, they all spoke English. Uh, they all believed in globalization as the mantra. So when things really started turning bad uh, and things started turning bad in Indonesia in an extremely stressful way in 97 and 98 uh, due to the Asian financial crisis, uh, the fact that I was able to speak the local language, interact literally with the taxi driver, with the vegetable vendor who were all suffering from this absolute free fall collapse of the Indonesian currency against the dollar really, I think, helped me that, you know, uh, uh, you, you may believe in globalization, you may believe in free trade and investment, but all politics is local and the local context and nuance is absolutely essential. And, and this is what, you know, uh, uh, I, I do read a, a great number of publications uh, during the course of my research this day, these days. And I know traditional newspaper journalism budgets are under pressure. So it's not possible for all Indian newspapers, for example, uh, to have bureaus all over the world. You know, the Hindu used to be a real trendsetter in our time. And I think that's very much the case even today. 
So, you know, understanding the world requires a journalist to really embrace different cultures, to understand the story from the other person's point of view. And I think, you know, having that humanity to understand, and, and I've seen many journalists in my time, you know, who really helicopter journalists who land in the place and, and uh, all interviews are set up for them. And they make these very broad conclusions based on their experience elsewhere. And, and that's why I hesitate to talk to you a lot about India today, because, you know, I don't live in India, I haven't, I've been, I've, even though I passionately follow everything that happens in India. And during the course of my IMF and Standard Chartered Bank career, I spent an enormous time in the corridors of Delhi and Mumbai. Uh, but I do recognize that you guys are the experts on the ground to tell me what is actually happening on the ground. And I'd, so I'd like to really speak about my own reflections and experience in three areas. No, so to simplify all of this, I want to talk about the power of the media. I want to talk about the power of the street. And I want to talk about the power of communication. And you know, I would submit that on each of these three propositions, there are profound challenges that we are facing today, right? So you know, I, can, I can talk about uh, 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 with a great deal of nostalgia about how powerful journalism and journalists used to be. And indeed, you know, when I moved to Bombay to work for India Today and Business India in the 1980s, I mean, you could pick up the phone and, and call up the CEO of India's biggest business house and that call would be taken because there was a belief that a small group of publications in India were responsible journalism, the practices of responsible journalism, and what they wrote and what they thought really mattered. So, you know, uh, uh, when I was in India today, you couldn't go into a party in the mid to late 1980s uh, without someone bringing up uh, uh, a cartoon uh, done by Ajit Nainan uh, in the latest edition of India Today, or articles by stalwarts like Shekhar Gupta and uh, T.N. Nainan. They were talking points. And that was the power of media at that time. Uh, this is, of course, pre-social media, Indian media. So it had a very different context. Uh, uh, you know, print and broadcast media, in fact, was very nascent at that time. And uh, the, the critical thing being, you know, how does journalism build public trust? And I think this issue really is very relevant today uh, because you've got this pervasive use of social media uh, people seem to be getting most of their news via WhatsApp forwards rather than, you know, uh, uh, logging into uh, uh, the Hindu or Caravan, two of my favorite Indian publications, uh, which I still follow. So I think journalism today is, is, is in a very different place. It may be strong in many, many respects, but it's also incredibly vulnerable in many, many respects. And uh, the way forward is not just journalism staying true to its mission and purpose, but I think uh, there's a role for governments, there's a role for, role for social media platforms in ensuring that this virus or this pandemic of fake news, uh, which, which is prevalent you know, in, in the US uh, as much as it is in India, as much as it is in Turkey and other parts of the world, so today's journalists have a very, very different set of responsibilities compared with uh, the journalists of my era. And, and I don't want to overstate or, or really uh, try to impart to this generation lessons from the past, which may or may not be relevant uh, 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 to the folks who, who are just completing the BJ this year and, and are about, about to embark on a career in national or indeed international journalism. But a couple of lessons that I thought I would impart really based on my own experience is uh, if, if you're covering extreme uh, uh, cases, you really have to go back to first principles, right? So if you're dealing with an epidemic of fake news, uh, the best way to counter that is not more fake news. The best way to counter that is to go back to journalism's first principles 
of really reporting the news without fear or favor, to reporting them in a balanced manner, to, to be reflecting the views of a diverse group of people, because I don't think the role of journalists uh, really is to, I mean, the role of the editorial page, of course, is to deliver judgment and to deliver uh, 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 a set of policy prescriptions for the government, but that's not the role of journalists. And I think somehow, and this is not an India phenomenon alone, I've seen that somehow in most other parts of the world, journalism and journalists have got, gotten into the opinion business. So it's very hard to read uh, uh, the news pages of a newspaper where a journalist is offering opinion in the first paragraph and then reporting the news in the 16th paragraph as to why what he or she is writing is really relevant about, right? So in India, you see this phenomenon of, uh, of extreme uh, uh, opinion channels. I think Shekhar Gupta calls them commando channels, uh, which I think is completely appropriate. So how do you bring journalism back to the center I think is a challenge, not only for Indian journalism moving forward, I think it's a challenge for journalism in democracies all over the world. And I have seen this firsthand, what has unfolded in the US in the last four or five years, uh, this absolute pandemic of fake news, which is really destroying uh, uh, social cohesion. Uh, in the context of the pandemic, we've seen you know, people who don't believe in uh, vaccinations, I was really pleased with the OU journalism uh, Twitter feed from a few weeks ago that you have uh, uh, collaborated with Google, for example, to deal with this uh, pandemic of uh, people scared about getting the vaccination. And I think that's a wonderful initiative. That's precisely the kind of thing that edu journalism education should be focusing on now. Now, why is it important to reinvent journalism? And I think it's important for my two other points, really the power of the street and uh, the power of communications. And I learned firsthand what the power of the street really is. What happens when public opinion turns against the government in power and the kind of intended and unintended consequences this, ca this can have really in destroying the social fabric of a country. And of course, I saw this in Indonesia. Uh, you know, when I went to Jakarta in 1995, the Indonesian currency was at 2000 rupiah to the US dollar. Uh, when I left the country in June 1998 to join the IMF, it was at 19,000. And, and this arc of instability in the way the uh, rupiah US dollar currency moved was very reflective of the breakdown in the social compact uh, in the country. And the social compact in Indonesia at that time really was uh, the government had all the answers. Uh, the government delivered economic growth and for a period of time, President Suharto did deliver economic growth uh, for, a, for an extended period of time. But when that became difficult, uh, when corruption uh, became very obvious, when the ordinary person on the street saw that even though you had high rates of economic growth, but that was not translating into tangible benefits uh, uh, to common people. That is, when, that is when you saw social dislocation. And you know, the Indonesian revolution happened uh, in the pre-social media era, right? It happened over a leisurely period of six months. Now you compare and contrast that with the Arab Spring of 2011 and everything that we have seen in the world in the decade since, right? So the Arab Spring in 2011, mid-December, uh, a vegetable vendor in a small town in Tunisia set himself on fire uh, because he was getting uh, repressed by the local municipal authorities. And uh, when he set himself on fire, that was the spark for the Tunisian revolution. And in a matter of weeks, uh, the president of Tunisia had to flee the country. Uh, this virus then spread to Egypt, where a Facebook executive called Wail Ghonim uh, posted something on his Facebook uh, uh, page, protesting against the arrest of someone in Egypt on the unsubstantiated charges. And that single post had the power 
to really bring millions of Egyptians to Tahrir Square and agitate for change that led to President Mubarak's exit literally a few days later. Right? So we're living in this hypercharged environment where social media can magnify uh, 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 public unease, public anger. And I don't think governments have really uh, uh, are beginning to get to grips. I mean, uh, I want to discuss a little bit of digital governance towards later. And I think government have, governments have really drawn all the lessons, wrong lessons from what happened with the Arab Spring, with the fact that you can, you can have this spark, uh, which can be so contagious that it can you know, bring down governments in three or four countries in a matter of months. And uh, this is propelled by social media to a more li limited extent by traditional media. And so how do you deal with this? And you know, one simple way of dealing with this really is a better government communication. I have spent much of my career in the public sector, you know, at the IMF where uh, 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 I was Asia Pacific spokesman during the Asian financial crisis. I was also global head of public affairs during the global financial crisis. And I think the IMF's experience Experience is a very interesting one in communication. So, you know, when I was a journalist in Indonesia watching uh, the IMF program, I was really astonished with, you know, how arrogant the IMF came across as a public institution in, 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 in prescribing economic policies, uh, which were very unpopular, uh, uh, which Indonesia was uh, uh, refusing to implement in many cases. But the IMF communication, where, where you know, it came across as, as though the IMF did not care about the sufferings of ordinary people. And you know, having worked for the institution for 17 years, I can, I can absolutely vouch uh, that everyone in the IMF cares about social outcomes and about human suffering. And, and this was simply a case where there was a mismatch between the institution's objectives and how the communications came through. I don't know how many of you remember the famous photograph, the fact that you can have a single photograph which can completely destroy the chances of an institution uh, 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 implementing a program. In Indonesia came in January 1998 uh, when IMF Managing Director Michel Kamdesu and President Suharto uh, uh, participated in a signing ceremony. So President Suharto had to bend to sign this agreement with the IMF. And Michel Kamdesu, who's six feet plus tall, towered above him and folded his hands. And that photograph came across as being the international community really almost launching a new colonial era in Indonesia by forcing this poor president uh, uh, to, to, to really digest these unpopular economic prescriptions. So there are many lessons in communications that I think governments can learn uh, past and present, uh, but all of this really becomes extremely difficult in the social media era, where what you really need is clear, consistent, precise communications. And we've seen you know, very little of this evidence during the pandemic itself, right? So you've got these many phases of the pandemic that we've been through since March, 2020, I can recount the American experience very vividly having lived through that, where there were contradictory uh, communications by various US government agencies. The president himself at that time, no surprise, was not a great believer in having a cohesive pandemic response. And as a result of which communications were a complete mess. And I'm not surprised that there's so much of public skepticism at this point in time about simple things like uh, the virtues of wearing a mask, uh, the virtues of getting the first, second, and th third doses of the vaccine, where uh, communications which are centralized can really help. But what you actually need is what you have done in OU journalism is doing the kind of workshops uh, uh, in collaboration with the social media platforms in really going down to the ground, in really trying to translate all of these complex 
public health uh, 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 policy challenges into very simple language to explain to people in multiple, you know, in, in, in multiple tongues, why it is important for them to take public precautions, why it is important for them indeed to take personal responsibility by taking a vaccine. Now, all of this may seem very, very simple, but as we, as we have seen over the past two years, government communications across the globe, and this is not you know, uh, by any means just pointing fingers at the US or Europe, I, mean, I think all governments, uh, New Zealand, for example, did extremely well at the start of the pandemic in the kind of communications that put a lot of people, a lot of, lot of New Zealanders at ease that the government was managing this pandemic very well. But, but in the period since then, even Australia and New Zealand have dropped the ball. And I, you know, uh, I have a friend who recently struggled to get out of New Zealand uh, to go to Europe, uh, where it is almost impossible, uh, uh, so, so my friend tells me, uh, to get a second dose of the vaccine and communications is extremely poor. So I think all governments have faltered. And I think there are many lessons. And I think there will be a proper investigation and a look back on the pandemic in terms of the public health response. But I hope governments and I hope uh, educational institutions will take the lead in really, ca in really calibrating uh, uh, and thinking about what are the communication lessons we can draw? What are the communication lessons that we can offer not only to governments, but also I think hopefully to the private sector and the public at large on, on, on the missteps. You know, one mantra we used to have at the IMF uh, coming, coming from all the terrible mistakes the IMF made in 1997-98. So we as the communication department took a vow that we would only make new mistakes, not repeat old ones. So, you know, cataloging what the communication mistakes have been during this pandemic, I think, I think, I think it'll be a very important step. And obviously this is a, you know, complex country like India, uh, uh, New Delhi has a responsibility for certain aspects of communication, but certainly from a Telangana state perspective, I know you can draw many, many lessons and, and present that uh, to the government. Uh, the final point that I wanted to make really is on digital governance. And I think we're living in this uh, very uncertain world where public support, public support for, uh, 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 you know, simple things like the role of government is diminishing. And, it's, you know, I, I'm watching this extremely, uh, in an extreme sense, in the United States, and I, saw this, and I see that there's enough evidence in India that they're wearing signs too at the moment. And you know, the two consequences uh, really of this uh, uh, complete decentralization uh, in social media networks that we're seeing. Uh, one is obviously poisonous news, uh, the spread of fake news. And the second one really is the impact this has on institutions of state where people don't seem to believe the official messenger anymore. And, and when people don't believe the official messenger, they believe what their cousin or their uncle will tell you in their WhatsApp forward. And, and, if, uh, and, and I've seen personally how these WhatsApp forward works, and I'm sure all of you have too. 95% uh, of the news happens to be fake. There's a lot of anger, uh, prejudice, and absolutely misinterpretations of, of national laws, which are conveyed, but people seem to believe this and place greater weight on this than they would uh, uh, hearing a boring communique or announcement or indeed a front page item in the newspaper. So how do you combat it? And, and you, I know there's a lot of push for global rules and global solutions, but I think global standards have a role to play. But I think fundamentally, uh, uh, this is in the domain of national governments in democracies to really create a digital path forward. And I think they are digital peril in, in terms of curbing and combating fake news. There's also digital potential in driving inclusion in digitalization. 
So we should not forget that this is not only uh, uh, can be terribly corrosive to society, but if managed well, it can be terribly, uh, terrifically beneficial to societies as well. But one thing that I have noticed in Asia is, you know, everyone's, every government seems to be following the China model. And the China model really is the great firewall of China, where this command and control, where there's a great deal of emphasis on surveillance of, of citizens. And governments seem to be drawing, governments and democracies in Asia seem to be drawing absolutely the wrong lessons from how do you build public trust? How do you build uh, 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 more secure networks? How do you make sure that the data of national citizens is not compromised? Instead of focusing on public accountability, uh, the focus seems to be completely on command and control and surveillance. So there is a China model uh, 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 making its way across all of Asia. Uh, you can either do the Great Firewall of China or you can pursue a China light model, uh, which I see being implemented in India, Indonesia, the Philippines, and elsewhere. And, and this, I think, is a very negative development. Really, we really need to focus on how do you bring back the voice of the citizen in all of this? Now, I, I, do, I don't want to end on a discordant note, but I do see a lot of hope and hopefulness mainly because I think younger people are taking charge. And you know, you've seen in climate change and climate justice, young student campaigners like Greta Thunberg who are leading the charge, who are really putting the older generation, uh, uh, older generation like me, who were not responsible enough in managing uh, the negative impact of climate change, really putting us on notice to take action in, in, in combating climate change. I think also in digital governance, we need this new generation, the new generation of OUBJ and BCJ and MCJ graduates. Uh, I think there's a tremendous burden upon you because you know, you're inheriting this very, very fragmented, uh, uh, potentially corrosive world. And in order to reverse this negative tide, we really need the help of this younger generation uh, uh, to use all their intellect, their knowledge about tools and techniques. You know, uh, uh, I'm sure I'm a dinosaur when it comes to managing social media networks compared to someone coming out of BJ still in, the, still in, in, in her 20s. So this is not a cop out, right? So I'm not saying that we older generation have failed and thus we are passing on the torch to uh, the younger generation to take charge. But I think the urgency with which the world is dealing with climate change. I think we've got to really put a similar level of urgency on digital governance. Otherwise, we're really going to have unintended consequences in our societies, which we simply cannot uh, uh, overturn or reverse. And you know, finally, January 6th in uh, Washington DC, uh, the, the insurrection that took place was completely engineered on social media, was completely engineered on the proposition of fake news uh, that the election outturn in November, 20, November uh, 2020 was fraudulent. And if that can take place in America, you know, the land of the brave, uh, the home of democracy, uh, other countries need to, need to really watch. And I think the beginning can be made by the younger generation in agitating for better digital governance from our governments. I recognize that I've taken up too much of time uh, I think what would really be helpful now for you as the audience to challenge me, to disagree with me, so that we can have a really active debate on many of the, many of the issues that I've raised uh, in this conversation. And once again, uh, want to thank Usmania Journalism, and once again, want to thank Professor Bashiruddin. I think of you every day. Thank you. Yeah. I think, uh, thanks, uh, Vasuki, for uh, that uh, very lucid, and uh, I think you've covered a wide spectrum, starting from letting out a small secret about how your perseverance and passion for journalism got you into the department and thereafter changed, uh, I think, everything for you. And also, the, the I think, uh, 
the perspective and the generosity that the department and the staff at the time had to encourage subjects like hollywood or you know something which was beyond the scope of i think uh, india or you know the uh, media at that point of time so i'm happy that uh, you started on that note and then travels through i think uh, a wide spectrum of uh, business journalism to a revolution to social responsibility to fake news this emergence of social media how we can face this and underscored the need for uh, reinventing journalism and also you know trying to take on this monster called fake fake news and finally i think you have also dealt on some of the things that uh, the future generation of journalists need to take on so that uh, yeah, journalism does and continue to play a greater role uh, thank you very much for that illuminating insights into what is happening in the media to social media to fake news and their impact we would like to now take some questions from the uh, participants today i already see three or four of them in the chat if you can see first is i think from vijay would you like to ask or should i read vijay tom i think you should just read it out or uh, okay uh vijay is asking should the government have some control over social media to ensure fake news do not go unchallenged i think i would like you want it to be challenged i think we will start with a challenge yeah. uh, thanks a lot tom thanks a lot vijay i mean the two ways one can look at this i mean i can i can present the us side uh, where there's a big debate going on in the us precisely on because social media platforms essentially take this uh, very creative interpretation that they are merely the platform they are merely the vessel and the channel through which individuals who are participants in the social media groups are are disseminating their thought, thoughts voices perspectives uh, uh, many of which uh, happen to be fake and i think this proposition has to be challenged a bit because uh, uh, i remember from my journalism days uh, uh, if if i wrote something false in india today magazine i mean arun puri would get a call from a corporate lawyer to essentially challenge uh, that the news uh, that i had written uh, was demonstrably uh, uh, malicious and wrong and the magazine had to take steps in correcting this so i think uh, so in that spirit i would say so there's a big debate going on in the us on on uh, whether social media platforms be held to the same standard and principle as a traditional newspaper now now of course the social media channels are so powerful uh, with trillion dollar market capitalization that they have the lobbying power uh, uh, to to probably stall any kind of me- meaningful legislation uh, but to get to the thrust of your question i think governments can set the rules of the road and this is beginning to happen in europe where social media platforms have to take certain responsibility this is not censorship uh, uh, certainly no one is expecting social media platforms to parrot the view of the government but there has to be you know uh, myanmar is a country that i follow very closely uh, what has happened in myanmar in the last 3 years in in terms of social media platforms magnifying hatred uh, and i see that the strong evidence this is happening in 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 india today as well so they need to invest in content moderation on a massive scale and the only people who can do that is the people who will be able to take the switch off and that is the government thank you so uh, you. professor mohan raj has a uh, question you know in continuation with what uh, vijay has asked uh, he would like to know what as one do when some government themselves are the source of fake news on social media actually on both social and conventional media if this is what uh, happens how do you uh, address this yeah i mean you got a very live example of this uh, 2016 to 2020 in the us where uh, i mean not the government right so let's be very clear it was a single individual in the form of uh, the president who was the biggest originator 
of fake and malicious news uh, in the US. And, and there was no, the only way you could combat that was through responsible journalism. And I know journalists uh, in other countries are not as fortunate as being uh, journalists in the US where you still have recourse to uh, 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 rules and laws in order to protect the rights of journalists, right? So you've got many, many countries uh, uh, including the one that you gentlemen and ladies are presenting, where the government has, has essentially using its tools. And as I'd mentioned, uh, governments and democracies really should be setting the rules of the road and not assuming command and control and directing uh, and controlling the narrative, which is what seems to be happening. And the counter to that, and it's very easy for me to uh, say the counter to that, is strong journalism, because I understand uh, uh, that, they, that many actions have been taken against independent media in India and elsewhere, which makes it very difficult for them to, to practice the kind of responsible and independent journalism that is needed in any democratic society, right? So, you know, this is a good fight that, that needs to be fought. Uh, uh, I think the ultimate check for this in a democracy is people expressing their views in the election. Uh, I'm not hopeful that is going to happen anytime soon, but as long as political leaders know that they're being held accountable at the ballot box, as happened with President Trump in the US in 2020, and there is a serious chance that you could lose your job because of that, that ultimately at the end of the day, that is the only check you can have. Okay, the next question is from uh, Mr. Venkateshwar, former resident editor of the Hindu. Now, he wants to know, uh, what do you have to say about a ruling party running a full-fledged IT cell in a campaign, a disinformation campaign against political and other adversaries and to mislead people? Well, I can, I can only say that this is not an India phenomenon alone. Right, this is a social media problem, right? So let's not blame any particular ruling party uh, for undertaking these uh, malicious tactics. They, they, they're taking place in democracies everywhere. And, you know, so uh, uh, one way of looking at it is, can there be global standard setting? I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical about global standard setting, mainly because it is these very governments who are going to be at the ITU in Geneva or at any UN body when these rules are being drafted and, and they have the right to say no, or they certainly have a right in how these rules are drafted. And global rules, you know, uh, uh, global rules have a place in many, many aspects of global governance. But I think in this particular case, it, is, it, is, it really comes down uh, uh, to citizen action. And uh, so in, in the case of India, you see that there's massive trolling uh, uh, that takes place and I get trolled. Uh, I am by no means an active participant in Indian political debates, but, uh, but you know, I do express my views from time to time. And I'm always pleasantly surprised uh, at, at how much uh, hate mail I get for even making very simple suggestions uh, like the Indian economy has, has performed subpar in the last 10 years. And, and the subpar performance of the Indian economy predates uh, this government. It's indeed happened from 2009. Right? So if you've got this very concerted government effort uh, uh, to discredit independent voices, I don't think democracy can survive. Right? So it really comes back to citizens' action, how much of space citizens feel that they can agitate for change and how much power they can wield at the ballot box in order to say that this is, this is unacceptable, right? So a simple editorial in a newspaper is not going to help. This really comes down to uh, people really taking this seriously and acting upon it. Um, uh, my friend Chandrasekhar has two questions. Uh, he says in the uh, 80s, investigative journalism was a powerful concept but now no one talks about it in the true sense of the word. Leaks are 
I think be becoming investigative, I think sources for investigative stories. And second is uh, journalism was once a respected profession. Now it is perceived as a, just another profession that has a negative tint to it. Is there hope? He has been arguing with me endlessly on this, so I think you can save me with a uh, more convincing answer to him. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I live most of the year in, in the capital, the world capital of leaks, which is Washington, D.C., where no new news, uh, which appears in the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, uh, is really uh, very carefully orchestrated and, and massaged and managed by very selective leaks, which really you know, uh, uh, is a way for the government or the administration to manage the message. So I, I don't see anything wrong in, in, in leaks. And I think uh, uh, in a very, very perverse sense, the more leaks that you have from the government, the more it enforces accountability, right? So uh, you can have managed leaks, but I think uh, you can also have leaks that you cannot manage, where you've got genuine voices in government who are upset with the direction of policy who go out and tell journalists that you know this is completely unacceptable and you need to highlight attention to this. So they're good leaks and they're bad leaks, right? So I, and, and I'm firmly on the side of good leaks. Being a beneficiary myself of many leaks in my journalism career, I simply cannot get myself to say that leaks are bad. Investigative journalism, and I think the nature of investigative journalism has changed. Uh, uh, what I see on Twitter, uh, uh, on a daily basis, and, and I follow many public policy experts uh, on Twitter on a range of economic subjects, and many of their insights, I would, you know, they would not be seen in the classical sense as investigative journalism, uh, but I would regard them as investigative journalism, where you've got a really good scholar in economics or public policy who's taking the time and trouble to post four tweets or five tweets about a particular government announcement, providing that historical context and saying this is wrong or this is right, whatever the case might be. And I think there are uh, still publications even in India which are devoting uh, uh, significant resources for investigative journalism. I mean, you know, uh, and again, I think our understanding of what investigative journalism, our generation thinks of Indian Express, Arun Shauri, and Shekhar Gupta. And I think you kind of have to modulate what investig investigative journalism in today's context means. Everyone in social media potentially is an investigative journalist. If, if you can report what is happening in your backyard. Uh, so what you need is an intermediary to take all of that information. And there's so much of information out there. So again, I have hope uh, on, on the investigative journalism side at least because there are people on Twitter, on Facebook, who are really doing the good job in, in highlighting stuff that otherwise we would not have the opportunity of uh, gaining access to. And yeah, you know, yeah. uh, so to your point, I think journalism yeah. is an incredibly honorable profession. After a long period in the public and private sector, I kind of have returned now as a quasi journalist. I, I have columns in Forbes magazine and Fortune magazine. And I hope that if I if I come to Hyderabad, the Hyderabad Press Club will allow me to once again become a member. Okay, I think that's a very happy uh, news to listen to because uh, you feel journalism still is a profession, not just like any other, but uh, can be pursued with greater vigor and make an impact. Now, a couple of questions from the I think department and students. Uh, Lakshmi Pratyush wants to know the parts and pressures of government is resulting in the transformation of news into propaganda. This phenomenon is happening not just in India, but around the globe. How should true journalism get out of such pressures and powers? Yeah, you know, I think the big change from our time is celebrity culture. And, and celebrity culture masquerading as, as you know, national uh, uh, policy. So you've got, and, and this is a global phenomenon where 
governments are very, very effectively wielding uh, propaganda by not being the messenger, by deploying a great deal of, uh, uh, let's call them external stakeholders. In fact, they're all celebrities who used to peddle, you know, toilet soap and washing soap at one time. And now they have, they have become uh, 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 intermediates and channels of propaganda, which really becomes all the more powerful because you know about who they are. You know, each one of these uh, uh, characters may have 20 million uh, followers on Facebook or Twitter, and they bring with them credibility, uh, uh, which otherwise uh, faceless uh, union minister may not be able to bring. So this, you know, this melding of nationalist politics and celebrity culture, uh, which is, which in a in a in a nutshell describes the rise of Donald Trump uh, in the U.S., is a very very worrying phenomenon. And and you know, countering propaganda, particularly at a time when the majority of the population seems to be genuinely enthralled. Uh, of this particular political leader, of, of believing what they hear from the celebrity uh, uh, propagandists and the official propagandists, right? So I don't want to give a facetious response in saying that there is an effective solution. This is an unfortunate reality. But again, I want to loop back, but right? this is the unfortunate reality in the US. And there was a time in 2017 and 2018 that I was given to despair that there's no possible way out until there was an election where young people voted in significantly large numbers and, and, and decided that the status quo had to go, right? So ultimately it comes down to no particular regulation that needs to be imparted. But if you're in a democracy, make your voice heard. Yeah, another question from Samina. Sir, digital media not having any agenda and also everyone posting as a journalist, fake news and spreading. What is the solution? I think she essentially wants to know that everybody now is a citizen journalist or a journalist and is posting uh, fake news. <coughs> yeah, my, my funny solution would be is delete your WhatsApp. Don't accept any fake messages from WhatsApp, right? So that is the single biggest channel I think of fake news today anywhere in the world, right? You know, you get these, you get these uh, retirees, and I have many of them in my family too, who send me fake news on a daily basis on things that have not happened. But there are other genuine digital media platforms. I think even in India today, right? So I read The Wire, for example. I read Scroll on on a da daily basis, who are delivering news. I think to a, to a digital savvy generation in a language they understand, in the channel that they access. Certainly, uh, uh, while I have big question marks about uh, the utility of Facebook as, as a news channel, uh, I would say Twitter is, is incredibly valuable. Uh, if you follow the right people on Twitter, you will get the right news. And, and of course, it is up to you to decide uh, what is propaganda, what is false, and what is true. So I think this comes down to individual responsibility and I don't think we've discussed individual responsibility uh, by the public uh, enough where, you know, because we've decentralized all of these communication channels, we put the power in the hands of anyone with a smartphone. And I guess the question to ask to anyone with that smartphone is what kind of responsibility are you willing to exercise in, in understanding what is happening in your country, in your community, and what responsibility are you going to exercise in disseminating that news to your family and friends? And I think that personal responsibility is, is the foundation for how we can combat this. I think there's a, there's a question from a PhD scholar I think from Punjab. I think uh, from the Media Studies Central University of Punjab. I think he is expressing concern with digital media today. Is misinformed masses can we deal with the problem of misinformation by 
<clears throat> by using media literacy programs and more on the social media literacy. Also, should we make media uh, literacy mandatory and part of curriculum from the K-12 level to colleges? I think is. Yeah, you know, that's a difficult question. You, once you begin to make things mandatory, it becomes very boring uh, for the recipients, right? So how do you use creative media? You know, how, how, do, you, how do you impart social responsibility? And I think that's really the answer here. I mean, the digital part is one element of this. You know, in our time, we used to talk about civics. Uh, when I did my BCom, there was an entire uh, 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 module on civics, on, on the fact that all of us had to be responsible in, in, in the way that we uh, 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 reacted in our immediate neighborhood and community. And unless there's a big government push for media literacy uh, and personal responsibility, and I think there's a misalignment really here in incentives. I don't think it, it helps any government in power to be teaching uh, the population that they have to be very careful in the kind of media channels they access, because these are the very channels that the government is using to spread for propaganda and fake news, right? So there's a misalignment in political incentives here. So any action I think has to be from the ground up. You know, again, I go back to Greta Thunberg and climate change. I think if we did not have the kind of student protests, which was really led from the ground up, uh, that this young uh, Swedish girl led four years ago, we would not have had this kind of awareness about the importance of climate change. It would have been very much uh, with due apologies to Mr. Akbaruddin, if he's, if he's still on the call, it would have been left to these incredibly complicated UN agencies who run these mammoth conferences. You know, we had this COP26 in Glasgow recently with very little to show by way of substance, right? So you need these global citizens groups really to use these social media tools smartly in order to impart the kind of literacy uh, that the questioner is asking about. Uh, one question from Padmaja Shah, uh, but for small windows here and there, both in social media and the mainstream media, the ordinary voters' concerns have disappeared. The muscle of big players peddling Islamophobia and communalism are overhelming the real concerns. How does one increase the visibility for such concerns? Yeah, you know, the unfortunate. She, she did say that she was sorry for the but, because she emphasized <laughs> the double T. <laughs> you know, one thing that I'm really, really uh, uh, negative about Indian media is over the past one year, I know more about. Sushant Singh Rajput's death and the arrest of Shah Rukh Khan's son, then I do know about social indicators, national social indicators. Then I know about you know, uh, the state of the financial system in the country. So you know, um, I, I don't want to uh, uh, say that all Indian media is following in this direction. But certainly from what I can see on TV, national television channels, from the private sector, many of the major national newspapers, which I used to respect in my time, the space for talking about real issues, which people should worry about, is shrinking, right? So the only way you can talk about water scarcity, I think, and, and, and I'm saying this in half jest, if you want to raise awareness about water scarcity in Bihar. You probably have to get Amitabh Bachchan to do that story today. The only way you can get attention, if you send a serious journalist uh, uh, to write about that, I'm sure it's going to, be, it's going to get lost in page 32 of, of the newspaper in one or two paragraphs. Right? So how do you create the space for serious journalism, so that you can focus on issues that people really worry, worry about. And you can see that election after election, both at the state levels and at the national level, people do react to what they see in the community. Even if the national news is not focusing on it, the voters are smart enough to know that politicians promised 
certain things in their constituency and they have not delivered and they take action accordingly. But you know, on the flip side, you want this to be a more active engagement so the governments actually act on the needs of the public rather than waiting every five years and this being determined at election time. I think that's uh, about all. Are there any more questions from anybody who would like to ask? I have one question to ask. Vasuki, are you coming back to Hyderabad or sitting down in the Washington, D.C. or London or Dubai or uh, oh. Indonesia? What is Sandra, your will you give me a job in, Will you give me a job in Hyderabad? Then, then I might consider returning. <laughs> I heard I heard it's a very expensive place compared to the Hyderabad that I left behind. <laughs> nice. I think the, nobody has uh, any questions. I have one uh, point which I caught, uh, which I think uh, was very pertinent. Uh, Vasaki, during I think your uh, uh, explanation, you said uh, there is a need to reinvent journalism. So, what are your thoughts on the way forward? Is there any um, you know, interesting aspect that you would like young journalists, journal people who want to get into this field to look at, to pursue, so that you, know, you bring in this freshness and fight all these monstrous things that are you know, impacting mainstream journalism? Yeah, I think, you know, the, I think we journalists, when I describe myself as a journalist, I think we kind of have a certain way and a certain template and a certain structure of delivering news, which I think is very, very uh, is suddenly becoming not only old fashioned, uh, but also faces the risk of irrelevance, right? So when you're faced with the risk of irrelevance, uh, uh, you kind of have to reinvent yourself. And, and reinvention takes, I think many forms and I think our our understanding and definition of what constitutes journalism has to change. I mean, let me give you a very concrete example. Uh, documentary filmmaking in the US today has become as powerful a voice as mainstream journalism has become. This was not the case. People seem to find the time to spend 45 minutes, one hour, to look at a documentary which looks at an issue in depth using the same principles and tools of a traditional journalist, making sure that all voices are heard and, and delivering it in a way which is interesting, not only to the younger generation, but interesting to any viewer who, who, who wants to find the time to understand why there's an opioid epidemic, for example, in the US. So what is the mental health uh, crisis uh, that people in India are facing because of COVID. So I think our understanding of journalism, uh, a, a typical journalist uh, uh, working for you know, the most uh, established institution in the US, I mean, does video, uh, does podcasts and does writing. So I think our own understanding of what a journalist is should change. We've got to be become more flexible and malleable to the times that we live in and we've got to go where our audience is going. I mean, our audience accesses news in many, many different ways. One manifestation of that is fake news. I think it'll be really a gross oversimplification to say that everyone accessing news on smartphones is getting fake news. There's, I think, a big audience out there for serious news, and we just have to figure out the formula of delivering news to them in an interesting way that they are used to. And, and, and get out of this uh, 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 feeling that journalism can only be delivered in one way. I think on that note, I think, uh, thanks a lot for the very insightful, uh, exciting, and I think very optimistic uh, presentation. And uh, I think uh, the very um, the nice way in which you have answered all our questions boldly and I think very interesting examples. Uh, I request uh, if Professor Steve is still there. Or is it just moved out? 
then i'll hand over to vijay yeah thank you so uh, as was expected your talk was as interesting as your quiz programs uh, i really miss some of the quiz programs uh, the art of quizzing everything is dead in hyderabad not anymore we don't have that kind of youth movements anymore which is very sad but coming back to your talk it was extremely interesting i mean i have also retired but i keep track of i read a lot of newspapers and i keep track of what is happening there is a sea change in the way reporting was done about a decade ago and what it is now so it's quite a sad state of affairs i i really hope the department of journalism all across the country and the world you know pay some attention to fighting this uh, malice and the uh, the the problem of uh, fake news i it, it is really pervading all our uh, you know social media we are not able to understand what is true what is not true anymore that is the problem thank you once again on behalf of uh, the chairman of the bashruddin memorial trust uh, matthew joseph and the other trustees like rangareddy somshekar and uh, dr usha raman i thank you profusely uh, vasuki for sparing your time to be with us and i also thank the department of journalism for having kindly hosted this uh, event and all the participants thank you very much we'll see you again next year hopefully in person and not on a, you know on a tv screen or a computer screen and let's have more interactions like this thank you very much good night thank you i think there are, there are two responses okay Yeah, I think they are exiting. You know? can close. So. So, I think everybody is exiting. Yeah, yeah. I think we can. And, uh, yeah, I could see Mohan Raj. Mohan uh, uh, Raj. Some anyway yeah. uh, for our record. Yeah. yeah yeah anyway nice thank you vasu if you are all, if you are still there thank you very much i think he also left yeah thank thank you thank you all yeah so we'll... yeah thank you and i think all of you have a good year ahead best yeah. wishes to all of you and your families sure Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Gana. Yeah, thank you, Krishna. Oh, finally you joined. Ah, I was there all through. Arey, come on, yar. You are so silent. Nah, yeah, I was listening because it is quite engrossing and interesting. And most yeah. of the questions that I felt were being asked by uh, in a more uh, uh, deft manner by others. So I was listening to them. yeah anyway nice thank you thank you tom thank you rangana thank you vijay so vijay thanks a lot everyone we have pulled it off at another okay at another year <laughs> right right rangan bye see you etla baagunna ha all well okay all all okay anta baane unda all well all well okay very good thank you boss manchi bye thanks thanks thank you so much Bye.